Afternoon, everyone. I wonder how many of you knew off the top of your, or know off the top of your heads, how many topics there are within extension two. Does anyone know how many topics there are? Should we count them? Should we count them? Complex numbers. Complex uh, numbers. Let's 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 try them. Do like sort of in some order, right? Complex numbers last year. Nature of proof. Then we had a look at 3D vectors. Most recently, we did further integration. And then finally, there is mechanics. Five topics. See how that says introduction to mechanics. Do you know what this means? We're starting the last topic. This means, uh, as has been quoted today, we're in the end game now. So I should point out, I should point out, in terms of Further integration, there's like a few teeny tiny bits that we have not uh, quote unquote finished, but if you have a look through the silver stop points that I gave to you right at the beginning of that topic, you'll see we've gotten, we had a pretty good go at exploring those ideas. Um, some of the textbook exercises, we've skipped over questions and a single exercise, but we're going to return to those as we go through. It's going to be pretty obvious actually, we are, we're not going to go very far from integration at all in this topic, but this does have a new name for a good reason. Mechanics is the final topic we're going to do. And I know that this struck fear into my heart the first time I taught it because, as some of you are um, currently, I was not a physics student in years 11 and 12. And I knew that that kind of, in some ways, put me behind the eight ball in terms of understanding and teaching this, but it also put me weirdly ahead. And I want to try and explain why. There are some differences and some commonalities between mathematics and physics as you study them. And that's kind of what we need to state right out of the gate. Some of this will be familiar from extension one, but other, others, other bits of it will be new. So these two uh, overlapping circles in our Venn diagram here represent, anyone want to guess? Classical physics and, and uh... mathematics <laughs> and physics. <laughs> Thank you, Emmanuel. Now, as is so often the case, Emmanuel, you're way too smart for me. Now, we're going to look at mathematics and physics here. And the first thing I need to say is that I'm going to draw this distinction, but it's a false thing to say these things are two separate things. I remember having a fun conversation with Mr. Ann once when he said to me, like, oh, physics that you do in high school doesn't really prepare you for actually doing physics in university because you open up any physics textbook in university and it's just... 100% mathematics, you're like, whoa, this, these are two separate subjects in two separate KLAs, right? So this is a false distinction to really draw, but there are still some important things that we should actually highlight are different. For example, in mathematics as you studied it, there's a bunch of things that we're interested in, we've explored, even within, say, extension two, that from a physics point of view, not interested at all, right? After complex numbers, what was that second topic that we did at the start of this year? Nature. Nature of proof. Now, I would put that in this area over here of things that we've looked at in mathematics that from a physics point of view, it's like, do I care what a contrapositive is? Not really, right? It's completely off to the side. Um, this is not the only topic. If we go back or even think within, say, the nature of proof, I don't know, I'm just pulling things out of uh, the top of my head right now. If you go back to say year seven and eight, we had to look at prime numbers. Like, how do you decompose a number into its prime factors, right? That was a cool mathematical thing to do. Nothing to do with the physical world, right? And I could go on and on and on. Um, someone give me an extension one topic that we've done that doesn't really have any connection to the physical world. Yeah, yeah. Financial maths. Financial maths. <laughs> I guess. I mean, sure. I asked for a suggestion, so. That's what I got, okay? We could, I've run out of space in my circle, but we could go on permutations and combinations. To some extent, you could talk about statistics and the normal distribution. Now, this gets to my point though, right? I said to some extent. Say something like statistics, right? It's like, well, chemistry is highly statistical, our understanding of how chemical reactions work. And of course, that's actually all driven by physics. You see why I say this is a false dichotomy, but still we can say there are some things we're interested in maths that physics is not. And the reverse is also true. Just so we don't play this game for a long time, I thought of three things off the top of my head that uh, we don't really worry about from a mathematics point of view, but in physics is kind of a really big deal, right? So in terms of energy, in terms of uh, like all the different, like, oh, I don't know, 
strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, um, electromagnetism, like forces, I guess you would say, from um, that point of view, those fundamental forces. Um, we can talk about matter, we can talk about space. These are things that even though we can understand them mathematically, within mathematics as a subject here, we don't really touch any of these, right? But the, <coughs> excuse me, the area that is right there in that sweet spot, which we're going to focus on, you've already like sort of dipped your toes in a little bit, well, we're going to dive right in, is what we would call motion, right? Now, motion is a big umbrella term, and we're going to dig a little further into what that means in this table underneath. So I want us to think about, from a physics and a mathematics point of view, some of the key things that separate these, and um, they're going to be really important, especially for those of you who do both subjects, because you can't apply one way of thinking in the other in some very obvious ways. Okay, so the first one is, what's the method of how you know things in all sciences, not just physics, chemistry, biology, how do you know something is true or reliable and not just opinion in science? Yeah, go ahead. By doing and actually observing it. Yeah, we call them experiments, right? We do experiments, we experiment, we have experimentation, and that is, like we literally call it, the scientific method, right? Um, it has to be repeatable. We have to be able to say, yes, okay, on the basis of this, I don't know why I chose that color, I want to keep in, in keeping with what I did up above. Um, I'm going to do this over and over again. I want to control for every variable I possibly can. Experimentation is the way that I know something is true in physics, right? Uh, I think about something like, say, the, uh, the Large Hadron Collider. You guys know about that, right? Oh, um, yeah. A billion proton collisions per second. A billion per second. It's just insane. They have to do it over and over and over and over again because experimentation is the way that you know things in physics. Experimentation doesn't cut it. In maths, you could give me a billion triangles per second and measure the angle sum of every single one and tell me they were all 180 degrees. And I would say, I don't care how many billions of triangles you've got, that's still not proof to me mathematically. What do we use instead? This goes back to our nature of proof topic. Probably I would say it with the letter L. What do we use? We use logic, right? We convince ourselves through a process of deduction. Okay? Now just before I come to your observation, I should point out, again, this false dichotomy idea, it's not like physicists never use logic, right? <laughs> and uh, the science faculty would be very upset if I said that. And it is ne it's not as though mathematicians never experiment, right? But the experiments are never enough in maths. And in physics, it's not enough to come up with a theory. You have to test it. You've got to go out and measure. You've got to put a satellite up there or something like that, okay? Xiao, are you going to make an observation? Oh, yes, uh, just saw the uh, example of the uh, angle sum of a triangle. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the definition of Euclidean geometry? Uh, yeah, partly. We so could, that is not exactly being proved. It's just we define it as such in a place. Yes, so this is one of the things which actually I thought about whether I should include it in this table or not, but it's sort of in common between these two, that there are assumptions that we just make. I didn't include engineering here because I knew I'd be out of my depth because Mrs. Lee's would be doing that much better than I would. Okay, now. I'm going to give you a fancy name for this, right? Well, in terms of the method of knowing something to be true, uh, what philosophers would call this is the epistemological basis. Uh, this is just so that when you get to uni, you can use fancy words. Um, epistemology is how do you know something is true or not, right? How do you know something is true or not? The epistemological basis in physics is experimentation. You've got no experiments, you've got nothing. In mathematics, it's logic. Okay, 